speaking. Um, and so I think what I'll do is I'll give a general introduction as to the, uh, the, uh, the philosophy and the, the mechanism of We Are Bank. Um, and then from there, uh, I'll just say to James, if there's one or two intermediate questions that need to be answered, then I, I, will, I will answer those and then we can proceed in that order. Otherwise, I don't want you sitting there for another 30, 40 minutes and hearing me just go on and on and on with um, questions burning uh, in, your, in your souls, so to speak. So um, for those people who haven't been to the or visited the website, then um, it's uh, www.wearebank, that's W-E-R-E-B-A-N-K dot co dot UK. Um, the website's been recently sort of uh, upgraded to take into account uh, an initiative that has been uh, available for some years now but um, is now due to the fact that there is such a, a tyrannical and financially criminal uh, degree of debt burden being loaded onto people for all sorts of nefarious reasons, which don't make, make any sense to anyone that's got any common sense. Um, what I thought it would be best to do is if we could roll that out, that initiative out to a more general audience, and for those people who aren't aware of a, um, a, a should we say, a, a political change philosophy, uh, originally, um, I think, uh, brought into the public domain by, uh, I think it was the Hungarian prime minister or president, a chap called Vaclav Havel. And it was called uh, a, an operation of what's called creative dissent. So it is really uh, designed to uh, engage and make a political change with, the, uh, with the, the intention of it being as reasonably pacifistic uh, as possible. And um, it, it, it's therefore very, very uh, appropriate that creative dissent uh, can be done with a pen, it can be done with uh, a checkbook, uh, and it can be done with, with passivist type demonstration. Uh, so the idea and then philosophy behind We're Bank originally, it was the idea first was, was put together by myself in around about 2012, but wasn't actually launched until I think it was March, around about mid-March 2015. And on the launch, that was just done with one uh, YouTube video of about five minutes, uh, which is available on my YouTube uh, channel links of which I think I've already sent to, uh, to, uh, to James or Jamesy, whether he likes to be called that, I, I don't know. Um, and what you will, well, what happened uh, from that point, we, we were overwhelmed with the success internationally, uh, obviously first at home from uh, the UK and Ireland that we were met with. Um, the, the amount of inquiries, the amount of membership that was loaded into us was so um, so fantastic that we really couldn't keep up with it. Um, so after I think um, the UK and Ireland, then the Americans got wind of it, then in Germany, then in France. And in the end, I think there was about 20 odd countries worldwide um, that were, were requesting uh, Weir Bank checkbooks. Um, the entire rationale behind the, the Weir Bank example is that uh, if anyone's aware of something called the Bank Charter Act, I think it's 1844, um, that was the, the, main, um, the main, I think, point in the architecture of the British financial system, whereby the Bank of England finally decided to take monopolistic control of all the currencies in the country. Prior to then, local banks could issue their local currencies, and to a greater extent, um, following that Bank Charter Act, um, certain um, trusts were still in form or still in place, which allowed um, the, the previous owners of those banks to take a, uh, a financial compensation from the Bank of England in lieu of their uh, agreeing to not print any more banknotes. So we end up with a situation therefore that the Bank of England has taken control of the money supply um, and from 1931, um, when there was the, um, the Gold Standard Amendment Act, uh, I think it was September 1931, from that point on, um, the British public, if they ever had any financial freedom, were firmly thrown into 
into a, a different sector. They were thrown into the into the private side. Sorry, they were they were shifted from the private side over into the public because prior to that date, anyone could settle a debt or his uh, his financial obligations in gold or silver, and it was just a transaction between the two parties. It was called financial settlement on the spot of time. However, post-1931, what we saw was an ever-increasing uh, encroachment of the Bank of England's um, uh, banknotes, which should only, under, under law, um, be circulated within the square mile of the city of London between the Bank of England and its sister banks that are involved in clearing transactions. But what happened over time is these banknotes drifted outside the square mile and began by, by both um, political incentive and private financial interests wanting this, um, the, the the currency started to spread further and further into the local um, the local regions, and that's why I say as we got to 1840, sorry, that's why we ended up with a, a system post 1931 and then post um, the Second World War, where you you ended up with a a much more um, imposed um, taxation regime under uh, the guise of PAYE uh, that was then introduced by various governments after the war because the the notes bared interest and then the interest obviously had to be had to be paid and the only people that were there to pay it are people like you or your your ancestors. So in effect, the the idea behind every type of loan or financial arrangement, whether it is for you to buy a new washing machine or to obtain credit in Debenhams, or, or for you to take Make a mortgage loan is that you come to a bank or a financial services provider and you ask them for a loan. In the old days, it used to be physical money, and then the gun placed against your head for the uh, for the, um, for the, the the moral obligation and the debt uh, of sinning if you didn't repay it was the fact that if you didn't repay it, then that money was being lost to Farmer Jones or Widow Twanky that lived at number 18. And there was a modicum of, of, of consensus within that. But that, that was predicated by the fact that there was a pre, uh, uh, what's called a fiat, a fiat currency system and that the amounts that were being uh, lent uh, as opposed to deposits were in reasonable ratios, about nine to one or maybe 12 to one. These days, those numbers are in the 200s, if not thousands to one. Um, so the situation was then that if you, if you wanted to, to borrow money, you would come to the bank or the financial institution and ask for them to loan you something. Now, the pretext of that was that you were coming empty handed to the bank. And that is anything but the case. And it's one of the biggest frauds ever perpetrated by the the Rothschild, um, J.P. Morgan, um, Rockefeller, um, can, can, you know, cartel of banking. Um, so the old goldsmith's trick really was to persuade you that what you had wasn't really of much worth, uh, and it wasn't obviously they would have you believe backed by anything. So as you arrive at the bank these days, let's say. Uh, any of the gentlemen in the front row or the ladies in the back, you go to the local high street bank, whether it's HSBC or whether it's um, Halifax, or, and you, you have an appointment, you go in and they make a calculation as to whether they're going to give you a mortgage. And in the end, they ask you to sign a series of papers. And in effect, what's happening there is they would have you believe that you actually entered that room or sat at that table uh, with nothing of value in your hand. But the signing of their document is the creation of the, pr the promissory note. Usually it's accompanied, obviously, by a, a, a mortgage deed, but there are two parts to the transaction. And this is particularly the case in a mortgage, not, not for a normal consumer credit uh, arrangement. But for the, the, the mortgage, there is the mortgage deed, and then there's the financial loan. Those two are welded together and cannot be separated. Uh, and if they are separated, then in effect, both parts of the contract become invalid. But this 
happens as a as a, a normal and natural means of monetization of the promissory note in the financial world today and the courts and the attorneys and the lawyers just allow it to pass by as what's called a, a commercial necessity should we say so what in effect has happened is and let's reverse the role here or the question if you actually went in for the mortgage agreement, whether it's in a, a financial, an FCA registered uh, mortgage provider or broker, or you actually go into the high street bank, if you actually went in looking for that mortgage offer and came out without signing the paper, or for example, the broker or the bank manager had forgot to get you to sign it at the end, which never happens, uh, apart from in the United States where there's lots of robo signing of contracts, um, then you have to ask yourself, was there anything there of validity at all? For an, Another example would be uh, a double glazing, Everest salesman comes to sell you double glazing or, or an upgrade on your, um, your, your patio windows or whatever it is, and he gets your agreement and he closes the deal, but he comes away in his joy and he's forgot to get you to sign the contract. Is it valid? And the answer is, it isn't. So that same argument is applicable in the bank. So you have to ask and begin to ask yourself, what is the value of your signature? What is it about the signature that entrusts the bank to then supposedly forward or allow money to be placed into your account? And what you have done, unbeknownst to you perhaps, um, uh, and, and this is really the case for most people, you've actually created something called a futures contract. Uh, so if you go onto the, the financial markets and if you want to find out what the, the cost of soybeans or gas or oil is in the future, you can actually look and, and judge for your best uh, interest whether the price will go up or go down. And based on that, you can, you can create a contract. Uh, and on that contract, then the, the agency that you're taking the, the goods or services from is obligated to provide you with those goods or services um, at that price. And so this is, in effect, what's happened is that when you come into the, the financial arena, uh, they're like a, a bunch of jackals or sharks waiting there for you. And they know full well and historically know full well that they are acting as what's called privateers or pirates, uh, which used to have to be able to get what's called the letters of mark from the crown to operate. And so in the in what's called the star captains of the, the 1800s and the late 1700s, um, they were entitled to pillage and take hostage uh, and capture ships on the high seas in return for giving a percentage of the booty to the crown. And that is exactly what still happens today with all your corporations, whether it is Virgin Money or Virgin Bank, uh, whether it's HSBC, whether it's uh, EDF, um, whether it's um, the gas companies, all these companies, all these corporations are acting in the same manner, fleecing you until your, your backs bleed because that's the nature of the game. And this is why people can't understand sometimes the nature of the revolving door in Westminster politics, where these people like Rishi Sunak, who used to work for a hedge fund company prior to him working for Goldman Sachs, he ends up coming out and then he works for a while for one of the bosses. I can't remember the chap's name now. He's a Frenchman. Um, and he was the uh, one of the hedge fund managers who helped fund Moderna. Who gave us the uh, the the the, uh, the so-called vaccine or poison death shot uh, that circulated around the the world very very conveniently? So Rishi Sunak has got filthy hands. He's dirty. He's the same as Boris Johnson. He's same as the rest of the criminally corrupt crew in Westminster Parliament. And it's no different in the United States. It's no st different in Germany. It is the hyenas sitting on the fence or the vultures sitting on the fence line waiting for the pickings. And so the moral crusade behind the educational platform, which was Weirbank, was to try and show people if you maintain this particular uh, way of dealing, 
the entire um, the, the entire game against you will never change and can never change. So let us try to do something about it. Um, and as I say, when we first launched in um, 2015, uh, the 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 number of people who attuned themselves to this mission and purpose uh, was quite um, overwhelming. Uh, in a very very short time, we were up to 8,000, then 12,000 members. And by the time uh, one of our IT people tried to rob Weirbank from me, um, we were set probably to have within the first two years around about 100,000 members. Um, so the question then became, did all the checks work? Did they pass through? Well, no, they didn't. And what happened is the more people posted their successes on, um, on um, either on YouTube with small videos or particularly on Facebook, what you found out then there was a barrage of shills and trolls that would go after them. And if they were um, or had been probably innocent enough to say where they'd had their, um, their council tax paid off or their, um, their car finance loan um, paid through for whatever reason, whatever those, those checks got through, um, then what would happen is the, the shills and the trolls would start getting in touch with these individuals in these in these uh, accounting offices directly and basically saying, did you know you've accepted a fraudulent check, check there, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they tried to unpick it. So as time went by, it got more and more difficult, though the people were still very uh, interested and very keen to, to, to try this, this new way of money cre creation. So all of that being said, the fundamental underlying architecture uh, and furniture of the Weirbank model is exactly the same, but better and on the on the basis of, of it's more honest and it's less uh, sorry it's more more uh, human facing than anything on the high street is that in in so that they couldn't do anything uh, to say that we were what's called check kiting or involved in fraud. Or, or scamming or passing fake instruments, which will get you arrested, yeah? Because if you know there's not uh, any money in your bank account and you go and try and pay off a bill with, uh, with one of your checks from NatWest, uh, you've got no money in your account, it's a criminal activity. However, what they have never ever at any stage coming up to the eighth year anniversary, March of next year for Weibank, not one individual has ever been uh, prosecuted. No one has ever been taken to court. And all those who were threatened with some type of, of punitive um, uh, investigation or, or penalty, um, the case was dropped. So what they did is they always threatened, they always threatened to bow them or make them bend the knee, so to speak. And then when push came to shove, it never, it never ever went to, to court or tribunals or to magistrates courts. And the reason for that is very, very simple. The, the, the belt and braces and the security is embedded in, in British and international law under the form of what's called the Bills of Exchange Act 1882. And it's also um, internationally adopted because of the power of the, of the British Empire uh, to, to forge its way around the world, especially through common, co common law countries um, that, that are like Australia, or Canada, or New Zealand, um, that you, you know of. And actually the United States, which is still owned by the, the United, uh, sorry, by the British Crown. So what we, we have there then is a, um, a, a system whereby the promissory note, once it is lodged, is as good as money. Lord Denning said it, and I can't remember what the case was now. I used to know, but I haven't spoken on this for a, a while. Um, he actually said, for accounting purposes, a, a, a promissory note is to be treated as, as cash in the hands of the accounting department. So what we set up with We Are Bank um, is a method whereby you could become a private banker. You would create it in your mind. And everything in the world, as you look outside you, is an idea. From the white chairs there to the, the, the darker chairs, 
to the, the TV, to the decoration and the ceiling. First, it was an idea in someone's mind before they put it into place. And so the, the basic fundamental ideas of all the financial um, contrivances on the planet are just ideas that the, the human being has had foisted on them and that have grown in popularity either because they were forced into this or coerced or threatened or in some other manner um, convinced that society was best run like that. But there does come a time when we can turn to a different uh, methodology which copies the old system but doesn't have the damaging toxicity of that old system. And in effect, this is really what Weirbank uh, did. Uh, it parked itself or it came alongside the high street banks and basically said, OK, we'll do everything you do, but we'll do it on the left bank of the river. Well, everyone else that's operating in the conventional sense is doing it on the right hand side. The river follows in the middle, left and right, and the view is exactly the si 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 excuse me, exactly the same on both sides. But the main difference is this is one that you've decided to create for yourself and for your future, and you have now become a private banker. There is also a phenomenon called shadow banking, uh, and shadow banks are banks that are not regulated by the financial markets. They're not regulated by the FCA. And if you want to go and look on uh, Wikipedia and type in shadow bank, you can look at one of the classic remarks by a guy called Ben Bernanke, who was ex-chairman of the Fed. Uh, and now it's an ex-Goldman uh, Sachs. I think it's, it, no, it's not Janet Yellen. I think she's moved out of the way now. But um, with, um, with uh, Janet Yellen, Ben Bernanke, shadow banking. Uh, what Bernanke basically stated is that shadow banks form an integral part of the, the financial system globally because they provide financial liquidity and flux in on occasions when markets would maybe not be able to function correctly due to um, you know, adverse financial demands. So anyone that comes along, like the FCA, and says, oh, we're a bank, um, doesn't seem to be doing anything, quote, that we would think it would need regulating by us. Um, and then it said, proceed with caution when dealing with we're bank, because we do not think that, you know, um, any bills or, or payments uh, or, sorry, um, debts will be, be allowed to be paid off. And to proceed with caution, if you look at the, the Road Traffic Act or the Highway Code, that is actually the, the, the expression for proceeding when the traffic lights are green. It basically says red is stop, amber is prepare, and green is to proceed with caution. So I personally at the time didn't think they could give us a more friendlier, um, uh, should we say, lecture on as, as to how we were to proceed, uh, even if I'd have written it. So. What then happened is the press got a hold of it and started to change it by making um, untrue statements that it was it was unethical. We were using a, a, a form of currency called the re, uh, and in one instance they were alleging the fact that you know we might as well be trading in coffee beans because who's going to accept a, a made-up fictional currency when in fact we weren't. All the promissory notes were actually issued in in sterling to the extent of 150,000. That promissory note then would be sent to Weirbank. We would then put that in a pigeonhole with your name on it. And so if you could then look, you would probably see that Weirbank resembled a, a, a similar scenario as the post office boxes at the post office, or if you were ever in, uh, in a university halls of residence, you would see that all the mail came in and it was put in pigeonholes down and down in by the, the reception area or wherever your residence was under A, B, C, D, E, and so, so forth. So that's what would happen. And that promissory note has a value. I did an interview on BBC Radio Stoke, which was then broadcast on, uh, on Radio 4. And what they came to the conclusion uh, at the end when, um, after they'd edited, edited it and made it look as if um, Weirbank was a bit of a, 
um, a step too far in the financial climate change. Uh, it was a time when Dave Fishwick opened a, a thing called the Bank of Dave. I think he's in uh, in Yorkshire somewhere. So we were about we're quite prescient and doing it around about the same time. And so what happened is the the the, the BBC um, lawyer or the one that they engaged to give a representation of what we a bank was actually up to. He actually said, I would warn people to be very, very careful, because from what I can see, um, the promissory notes that are being produced by people are legal and enforceable and absolutely valid. So what greater um, praise could we have than that? Now, obviously, then the press didn't want to pick up on that and start broadcasting it here, there and everywhere because the nature of the, 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 the media generally is to control and to confuse and to distract people with endless nonsense um, as to who's going to eat the next, uh, uh, you know, the next unsavory part of some animal in an Australian jungle or, or, or whatever. So in effect, this is where we ended up. We ended up with a, a formula that was unbeatable and over and above that, there are certain, and I'm coming full circle now because I'm we're we're back towards the, the the newer initiative, which is an old one but being rebranded, uh, is the debt assumption program, which forms a part of this method of creative descent. And the the debt assumption program basically says to people, when you actually created the the the, the loan or the credit. The actual piece of paper that you signed, that was either one of two things when it entered the bank network. It was either an asset or a liability. Now, conversely to anyone uh, in, in normal business um, who has to have goods to sell, with the bank, what happens is completely the opposite in Alice, Alice in Wonderland 2.0 world because you would think that the bank's assets were the money in its vaults, but that's not. It's their liability if the money is in the bank, because the money has to be stored, it has to be insured, and it has to be used. Otherwise, they have to pay interest on it. However, their assets are debt. The debt on the books is what gives the value to a bank. So it's quite perverse, really, when you look at that, that the thing that is the biggest value to a bank is what it doesn't have, i.e. nothing. But what it does have is it has thousands and millions of pieces of paper signed by people like yourself and like me out there that are all now obligated to operate like rats on the wheel to keep those payments going. Not only the amount that was initially borrowed, but punitive rates of interest um, over time. So that is, in essence, what Weir Bank was about, what it sought to achieve. And in effect now, uh, with the number of promissory notes that were actually handed over to us, we've probably got in, in the region of about 1.5 billion in what you would say is security assets. And so these not only um, are there to help the people that already joined, but they're also usable if you entered or would entertain a fractional reserve system to multiply that by fairly low numbers by the factor of two to three, whereby uh, we could actually get involved in, in uh, should we say, more far reaching community initiatives. When Weirbank first began, it was almost every man for himself. Lots of people from uh, the European continent, uh, and I won't mention any names of countries like Germany. Uh, they they came on, and they wanted they wanted to buy stuff. Uh, they were trying to use the promissory notes to buy Porsches or to pay for I don't know uh, building materials or, or or stuff that really was just out and out. Um, um, new purchase. But the prerequisite and the fundamental protection for Weir Bank was always, and this is why I think we, we, we always got left alone, really, is that 
it was only for the mitigation of debt obligations. And a debt obligation can only be paid or it can be paid with what's called legal tender. And so, and the next part of the, the deal was that in many instances, uh, more later than, than prior, what would happen is the bank or the creditor would try and refuse the check or the check would go through the bank and the bank would simply refuse to send it or pass it through clearing. Um, the creditor would sometimes say, we're not going to take this, let's say virgin money, because uh, it's not legal tender. We're not obligated to it. But you have to ask yourself, if virgin money or uh, any other enterprise, a credit card company um, like Visa or MasterCard, if they actually wanted paying, then surely it would be in their best interest simply to pass it on to the clearing department of Weir Bank to see whether the funds actually ever would, would arrive. And you have to ask yourself, why didn't they do it? And why wouldn't they do it? Equally, you, people sitting there, could have sent a check uh, to, um, I don't know, to, to the local authority for payment of council tax. And either the council would refuse to send it on because they've got some circular might, which might have said, um, you know, uh, we're bank checks are not to be accepted because they're not legal tender. Or they sent it on to the bank, but the bank unilaterally closed ranks because they're all the brotherhood together and they refuse to actually then send it for clearing. Now, there is an obligation under the, uh, the banking acts that, um, that I think it's uh, Uniform Rules of Collection, URC 522, that actually specify, and then we got lots of this because we insisted and told the people, that they have to do what's called a, pr a special presentation. So if you present a check in the bank and they say, well, we don't think it's gonna clear or whatever, then you can insist on what's called a special presentation check, whereby they have to then attach it to a piece of paper and they have to send it physically, like was done in the old days, before we had Bill Gates and his, uh, his electronic uh, everything systems. And um, they're obligated to do that, then wait for the reply. In the meantime, they have to make and uh, honor the fact that they've received a check. And until they've been told otherwise, they have to assume that it's good. Um, so that, in a nutshell, I think, is the, 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 the general operating procedure for Weir Bank and its philosophy. Uh, it's there to create, or as I say, to cause creative dissent. Um, here, going through in the future, I would strongly uh, encourage any, any people in groups that wanted to do it, don't do it as an individual, do it as, as, as a group, because um, we are much better educated now. Uh, we had lots of information come in from people who have worked the system in Australia and in Canada and in the United States as to what works best or what works better. And... Coming from that, we can see also um, um, there's a video on YouTube. I think it says, we're banking Bitcoin come of age. Now, I don't know why the guy, a chap called Anthony Badalu, he was a, a, a um, FCA financial consultant, why he ever uh, associated we're bank and Bitcoin of coming of age. But that's what the video is entitled. And if you go on and have a look, it's quite an interesting conversation because he paid his, his annual financial services license fee with a Weir Bank check. Um, he ends up in, a, I think, a 30-minute discussion with the guy on the end of the phone. Um, but this is really just to emphasize the point that if it's done intelligently, if it's done collectively, it can be much more successful than if you're just operating as an individual. Because... This is what the, 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 the divide and conquer, the ordo ab cow as the Masonic emblem out over many of their, uh, of their um, meeting room state, their lodges. Uh, this is really what they want to keep everybody separated, everybody struggling on their own, and they don't like it up em, as they used to say in dad's army. So it's always better if you can, if you can come together and try and work it, Plus, it gives you um, it gives you a bit of uh, maybe helps the fund to go along, and uh, I'd be more than willing to help anyone that wants to do that. 
Um, in addition, uh, before I forget, I'm holding the webinar before Christmas. I don't know exactly what date, but if you're interested in it, then uh, maybe let Jamesy know or uh, we can, I'll put something together. It was originally more to do with people who are wanting to actively engage in the free man movement or the sovereignty issues that befall uh, this, this, you know, the, the desire of people to sort seemingly or try to break free. And for me to try and explain why sometimes, well, not sometimes, why they can't get anywhere. Um, I like to offer myself up as a model. Um, I've been very successful in what I attempted to do when I first launched the Peter of England um, moniker or brand in, uh, I think it was 20, 2011. Uh, for those who haven't seen that, maybe have a look at the, the YouTube channel. And um, I've always been treated very well. Um, I've been treated well by the police. I've been treated well by the courts. Um, I've been fined. I've had my license taken from me, uh, but returned. So whatever I was doing um, seemed to come across quite well. And what I was doing is I was notifying uh, all the constabularies or the chief constables, plus the attorney general and the crown uh, in the United Kingdom that this is what I was proposing to do. This is what I was intending to do and when I would do it. And I didn't really want any interference from the constabulary or um, police uh, unless there was an express um, order from the attorney general himself. And so that was the, the means of, of, of actually pinning responsibility to an individual because otherwise the policeman says, I'm just doing my job, sir. Uh, yeah, but who told you to come and do this today? And then it goes to the chief constable, but he's not aware of it because he says it's nothing to do with me. And so the, the, main, the main route to creative dissent is to let people know what you're doing before you do it, unless you're following some of the rules for, um, there's a very good book, if you haven't read it, uh, it's called, uh, it's by a, an author called Saul Alinsky. It's called Rules for Radicals. It is the playbook uh, for uh, probably British political activists, United States activists, activists, people like uh, Pelosi, Clinton, uh, Obama, have all used it very successfully in their neighborhoods as a coaching tool to, to incentivize and direct organizations like BLM, Antifa, and all this other nonsense crap that seems to be there to poisonously toxify society so um and then the the other thing that i would think i would refer anyone to 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 look at and read on the basis of why socialism and socialist policies in socialist countries can never work uh and the united sorry uh, and the, um, the the soviet union china and all these models uh, are, are the proof of that is it's a guy called Frederick Hayek, and it's called The Road to Serfdom. And that's, uh, it's got some very good um, uh, and meaningful um, protocols and insights. And so that brings us full circle now. I think I, that's the education. But Weirbank definitely initially was for a, an educative purpose to highlight to people why the system is like it is and how it's been manufactured under your feet for you not to really uh, have much uh, cognizance of what you were walking on or operating within. And with that in mind, um, people think, oh, well, that's not like that today. We've got all these regulatory authorities. We've got the SEC. We've got the Financial Compliance Authority. We've got these regulatory bodies, blah, blah. No, they are the gatekeepers to, one, to ward off the vitriol that's directed towards the ins institution and then to trick the individual that they are being looked after and regulated. Uh, a very classic example was the funds that were stolen by the, the, the Bernie Madoff um, pyramid scam and also the one that's recently happened by FTX, uh, crypto exchange. Billions have gone missing and nobody seems to know where it's gone. I tell you, it would take them 35 seconds with a good IT guy to find out exactly where it was rooted and exactly where it went. So mm -hmm. the degree of corruption inherent in the system is obvious from the fact that in the one hand, 
They've imposed austerity measures on people like you for the last 20 years with QE1 and QE2 and TARP, TARP, remember that? Toxic Asset Relief Program. But it was all for the corporations, it was all for the big guys, and it wasn't for people like you. So I basically said, I'm sorry if there's children in the room, fuck them, let's introduce our own protocol, let's do a QE2 for the people, let's do a toxic asset release program for you. And we're back there for steps in and says, forget it, we will buy the debt from you. It must be of value because the bank can take you to court and put you in prison and almost kill you so that you pay it. So it's got to be of worth. And that then belies the question, who's the creator? If you created it, you can do whatever you want with it. They'll say, no, you're obligated to us to pay it, but you can transfer it. Look with your credit cards. You can go along in the credit card. Uh, you remember when Egg launched the, the credit card company, maybe, I don't know, 12 years ago, was it? I'm not, not sure. And what they did is they didn't, the market saturated with credit cards, but what they did is they brought them in from other providers and they offered, a, 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 I think, a golden handshake to come in and maybe three percentage points less on your APR. And that's the only way it could get people in. So the banks, when they're all shaking hands together and sitting around the family table, making their discussions and plans for you, they've got no mind, uh, no problem with passing the book around there. But when anyone else wants to come in and join the party, uh-uh, you're not welcome. It's financial apartheid. And therefore, in this crazy woke system, I'm going to claim that for any transactions that I, I would in, involve people in getting in, involved in, that they can't discriminate to the extent that they want. And anything to do with a monopoly is in violation. I know you did Brexit, and hopefully some of you are in favor of it, but I think it was all fudged. Um, for the for the um, for the Brexit situation, Article One of the um, of the the convention, the European uh, Convention, states that any monopolistic practice whatsoever is totally unlawful, uh, and this obviously extends to the effect of the European Central Bank being involved in policy making and uh, telling you what you can have and what you can't have. And finally, hopefully, then I can just uh, have a pause and try and get some questions. What we're getting to a, a point now is that I think his name's Augustin Chavel or Chatel. He's the, um, the governor of the, um, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. They're basically coming out now and saying that they need control over every asset um, and know where it's being spent, whether a 50 euro note has been spent in Madrid or a 50 uh, pound note is being spent in Buckinghamshire or in London. And to that extent, they want a central bank digital currency introducing fast. And this is part why the, uh, the, the, uh, the great reset is coming. And so what I say is, sorry to say this word again, but I do like to say it occasionally, fuck them. If they want the reset, then let us give them the reset. Yeah, uh, we're bank. If you go onto the website, you'll see that last year we put together banknotes, and I would I would severely recommend or advise any local community just to try. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you you don't do it or you can't do it because, to be quite honest, it's such a makes such a, a minor difference, but it could make a great deal. Is that you start to prepare a a currency that could be interchangeable or interoperable um, for when the ATM machines stop spitting out the, the, the banknotes, uh, because that will come, that will come for sure, and they will bring it in um, fast. And if you think it's not possible, did you think three years ago that they could have 7 billion people walking around with a fucking face nappy on uh, and being convinced that they needed to have some type of stuff stuck in them, the, the, the content of which they didn't even know. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't have had it. All I'm just saying is that when you, 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 you know, if you're going to be a sheep, you better know who your shepherd is, because there's a lot of stuff that's still going to come out uh, eventually uh, uh, as to what happened here. So 
Uh, that's really what I would say, start to look at selling the debt. You've created it. You're called a holder in due course. And for those people out there, look at section 15, section 42, and section um, 68 of the Bills of Exchange Act 1882, which provides for um, a payer for honor supra protest, a referee in case of need. And the third one, I can't remember what it is, so I should. Um, yeah, payer for honor supra protest, referee in case of need. Sorry, yeah, and a refusal to accept a tender. Yeah. And don't forget, it's the tender. When they say legal tender, it's actually the tendering of the payment, which is the payment. Is it a noun or is it a verb? Yeah, and so there is some, um, and also for those who were a little bit uh, into sort of researching stuff, um, UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, Article 3, 603, refusal of tender of payment, the extent to which there is a debt obligation if the creditor refuses the tender of a payment to that extent, the obligation is null and void. You've got to start using their game against them. And you've also got to get into a position that if, and there's lots of people out there and I think things are gonna be getting worse, before you end up going into a courtroom, you've got to make sure that they know who's coming in. If people just turn up at court, um, they are gonna get fucked four ways from Sunday. And the reason for that is simple. There is only one question that the judge ever asks, but never does ask, actually, because no one would ever um, would think of this, um, to the clerk of the court. The clerk of the court comes from what's called cleric, clericus. It's a, an ecclesiastical appointment. And the clerk of the court of the crown in chancery is the head department for all clerks within all courts. And the only question the judge needs to uh, be told or asked is, has this man, because they didn't have these pronoun problems in the old days, has this man proved himself to be alive? Because all of you, as you enter the magic circle of these administrative pagan Roman curia circles um, are operating under presumptions. There's 12 presumptions running, and of these 12 presumptions, one of the main ones is really that you are regarded as a ward of court, therefore a child or minor, and this is why you have to have a representative, a guardian, to speak on your behalf, because you're deemed to be incompetent, lunatic, cretinous, and an imbecile in front of and the more you try to challenge the system in the judge's eyes and his protocol, what he's doing is he's having it further confirmed that you're a lunatic. You don't know what's going on. You don't know the rules of the game. And therefore, the bar attorney or the barrister is there to speak for you or to prosecute you. So what you're actually going through is a, um, how do we call it? Uh, the sacrament of confession in a Roman Catholic arena. And don't think just because it's Protestantism, it's any different. All the symbolisms, all the architecture of the Protestant church had to be purchased and they have to pay because it's, it's part of their um, copyright. Yeah, The Roman church didn't give up anything. Anyone who wanted to use it had to pay for it. So really that's what you're up against when you go into a court of law. And if you don't do your, your homework properly or correctly, you'll end up in, in great difficulties. So, um, and, and there's a final one, might, one or two people might think, oh, that's not true at all. Have a look at notaries, notaries in England and Wales, who they are appointed by. Does anyone know in the audience? Hand up, all notaries. Can't hear anyone, but I'm sure somebody said, said the right answer. So well done to whoever you are. But what I would say is they're all appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury from Lambeth Palace. Go check it out. Look at the Worshipful Company of Scriveners. They are the leading um, notaries in, in, in the world from, uh, based in the, um, in the city square mile. 
but very cleverly, they're moored on the Thames. So they're on water, they're not on land. That's their, their full address. So very interesting stuff, very interesting material. Um, and what I'd love to do is to come over to England and fill an audience of about, I don't know, James, see if you can do this for me. 5,000, 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 people organized with a mission and purpose. You would have that country back within a week. And the main, uh, the main revolutionary idea here is to do it peacefully, but there's also um, a methodology that protest is absolutely irrelevant, inconsequential. Don't even bother to do it because the elite establishment know that if you go out on the street, and you go home at six o'clock because you don't want to miss Strictly or you've got to get the kids from your parents, uh, you've lost. There used to be a movement in France not so long ago called uh, La Nuit Debout, means up all night. The idea is you take to the streets with a movement to protest. You don't go until you've achieved your purpose. Otherwise, don't bother. And on that happy note, I don't think I've forgotten much, but uh, I probably covered a lot more than you thought you were going to get. and. Um, over to 